Okay, so uh, so let's pick up the thread again from uh, uh, where we left it yesterday. So, um, <coughs> uh, so. Uh, and so let me very uh, briefly recapitulate what we saw uh, uh, yesterday, uh, which is that uh, so the central points uh, are, were the following: uh, that uh, <coughs> so we we were looking at this example of the string theory on ADS three times S three times T four. Uh, uh, as a candidate example where we might be able to see an enlarged uh, gauge invariance over and beyond the Vasiliev gauge invariance uh, and the symmetric product CFT, which is uh, believed to be dual to this vacuum, uh, <coughs> is a, a symmetric product of a free theory, namely of uh, T4 or four bosons and fermions. And this theory... Um, uh, being a free theory has a very large chiral algebra. So the first thing we uh, uh, showed was that the single particle generators uh, of the uh, chiral algebra uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the symmetric product was in one-to-one -one correspondence with the, uh, with the chiral sector of, uh, uh, of a single T4. Uh, and uh, uh, so the single particle, so this is, of course, not an isomorphism of chiral algebras. It's just a correspondence between the elements of the algebra uh, uh, and I, uh, and if you remember, it was essentially uh, uh, something like this. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 so this uh, 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 was one uh, observation, not perhaps a very surprising one, uh, but uh, uh, the first observation uh, uh, to make. And uh, and this uh, it was important, as I s stressed, uh, that uh, these generators on the symmetric product, these are all these single particle generators, are independent generators. At finite end, there would be relations between them, but we will be working at large end, so uh, we'll consider. So these will all be independent single particle generators. Now the next question was the algebra of these. Uh, single particle generators uh, uh, and uh, of course you could say it's just the chiral algebra of the T4 theory which is one answer but that's not an answer one would I think be very helpful uh, if we wanted to uh, try to use the Vasiliev theory and things we know about the Vasiliev theory to learn about the unbroken uh, gauge unbroken symmetry phase of string theory. So uh, we tried to organize this. Uh, uh, so to understand this algebra, we organized it in terms of uh, uh, representations of the higher spin algebra or the W infinity algebra. In fact, it turned out that it was uh, I showed you that there is a W infinity algebra of, uh, um, of uh, free bosons. Well, uh, I mean, to do this, uh, as I said, I would, uh, I, I would uh, restrict to the simpler case where instead of a T4, we just have a single boson, just R. Um, so uh, uh, R4 or T4, uh, we, we just strip off all the complications due to supersymmetry and talk about uh, the, the simpler case of a single boson uh, because all these structures are present even in the symmetric product of a single boson. Uh, uh, so we organized the chiral sector in terms of representations of a higher spin algebra. 
uh, which is this W infinity algebra. And the structure we found uh, was the following. Uh, that the W infinity algebra itself, uh, uh, this was the W infinity of one algebra, which, so there was, so when you organized it in terms of representations, the, uh, the representations were labeled by one integer, the infinite many of them. Uh, basically, they were labeled by a completely anti-symmetric representation with n boxes. Uh, and uh, the n equal to 2 representation was the, uh, the one which corresponded to the, uh, to the uh, W infinity generators themselves. So, so that was this uh, uh, column. So all the W infinity generators so uh, uh, form, if you wish, some kind of adjoint representation. But then there were all an infinite lay many other representations as well. And uh, these were, roughly speaking, so the top component of these were, was del phi to the n. Uh, uh, so th these were the bilinears. So the, the top component here is the stress tensor, del phi square. Uh, but you have uh, each of these representations comprised of uh, n, n linear quantities of these bosons. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I showed you that the chiral partition function uh, of a single boson uh, uh, corresponding to this decomposition was the sort of Q binomial identity. Uh, 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 this was the character decomposition uh, of uh, the full chiral algebra. So this enumerates all the, uh, this enumerates the chiral sector. Uh, and uh, 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 so this was the full chiral sector uh, of a single boson. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that can be decomposed in terms of these. And each of these corresponds to the character of this nth uh, representation. Uh, so this uh, identity, which I showed you how you can derive uh, from this sort of decomposition of the Fox space, um, this uh, Q binomial identity uh, is, the, is essentially this character decomposition. So we had this sort of vertical, uh, so we called this the vertical W infinity. Uh, because we've arranged things in these columns and the W infinity action is sort of vertical. There is some highest weight representation and then you have uh, the action of the W infinity generators. Okay, so uh, any questions? So this, of course, this way of uh, organizing it is useful because it tells you uh, uh, how the, so it firstly tells you that the Vasiliev higher spin symmetry is a subset of the full, uh, full algebra. And it tells you, moreover, how the other generators are, are transform under this W infinity symmetry, how they are charged under this Vasiliev gauge symmetry. Uh, uh, and therefore, if you want to take the commutator of some arbitrary element here with, uh, with uh, something over here, that's just given by W infinity commutators of the representation theory of W infinity. But uh, as I said, that's uh, what we are interested in is the full algebra, the commutators between arbitrary generators, something here and something here. Uh, how would you do that? And that's where uh, 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 we will see the presence of a new higher spin algebra uh, will enter. Uh, so the basic observation behind that is quite simple. It is what maybe many of you have seen. It is uh, uh, the property of two-dimensional field theories, which is known as bosonization, uh, which is the statement that, uh, in our context, uh, it's the statement that uh, the CFT uh, of a single real boson 
uh, is equal to the neutral uh, sector uh, of two uh, fermions sort of carrying opposite charge. Uh, 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 so in fact, this is captured by the identity. Uh, so uh, uh, at least at the level of the partition function, uh, you can write uh, uh, this as the state following statement that the, uh, that this partition function is the same as a fermionic partition function. Uh, but restricted to the neutral sector, that is the uh, Y is uh, chemical potential, so you have two fermions carrying opposite charge, that's why Y and Y inverse, and if you restrict to the neutral sector, uh, uh, that is the uh, sector which is independent of Y, the charge zero sector, then this is the sort of partition identity, which is a special case of a more general identity relating bosonic and fermionic partition functions, uh, which, so if you haven't seen this sort of thing before, you can just look at Ginsparg's review on 2D CFD and, uh, 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 and you'll see the uh, proof of this statement uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and others like it. So, um, uh, so that's uh, the thing that we will exploit that basically uh, uh, the, uh, 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 that a boson uh, uh, partition function can be written in terms of, um, uh, well, the, uh, well, we'll exploit the fact that the full partition function, but the full theory itself, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, map it uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to these uh, from, uh, you can map the bosons to the fermions. And uh, what will be important for us is the following sort of dictionary that del phi to the s plus some lower order terms uh, with some coefficients, but uh, those will not be um, so important. This is equivalent to a bilinear of fermions uh, uh, with s minus one derivatives sprinkled over this. So the simplest case is when s equal to two, uh, the stress tensor del phi square of the boson is equivalent to psi bar del slash psi, which is the stress tensor of the uh, fermion theory. But more generally, there is a, uh, uh, there's a mapping uh, which uh, uh, goes as follows, and this will be crucial uh, uh, for us. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, but before I really use that, let me uh, tell you how uh, this identity, this uh, bosonization identity, will be very helpful for us in, uh, uh, in reassembling this chiral algebra in a different way. So for that, we will take one of these building blocks, these fermions, and I'll write down another decomposition of the fermions, which uh, is very similar. Uh, so let me look at one of these building blocks. And uh, so I claim that this is given by a very similar decomposition to this one. Uh, so, uh, so this is, in fact, yet another example of the Q binomial theorem, uh, but it, you don't even need all those fancy. This thing, just like I showed you a combinatorial proof for this, we can uh, very simply show a combinatorial proof for this. Uh, that uh, 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 goes as follows. Again, I'll sketch it out, and if you have any problems, ask me in the discussion session, and uh, I can flesh it out some more. So, uh, uh, so basically, what's the Fox space of a single fermion? Uh, we can. Uh, 
the, the, uh, the, uh, we can assemble the Fox space of a single fermion uh, in terms of uh, modes uh, of these fermions uh, acting on the vacuum, where each of these MIs are, uh, uh, are uh, greater than or equal to zero. Uh, but because they are fermionic oscillators, we can actually regroup these or reorder these uh, and write it in the following way. We can order it in terms of the modes I, I can easily, equally well, label this sort of general state uh, in terms of these. Uh, it's very similar to what I did for the bosons, except that here, because they're fermions, no two oscillators can have the same mode number. So I've taken that into account by this one starts from minus half, this is minus three half, minus five half, and so on. Uh, and each of the k's, are then greater than or equal to zero, and these will all be distinct, uh, distinct oscillators. Uh, and a general oscillator state uh, can be written in this form, as you can, with a little thought, convince yourself. And then, if you see, now each of these, uh, each of these has a R charge equal to one, so it will have a factor of y to the n when you're counting uh, its chemical potential. And what is its dimension? The minimal dimension is half plus three half plus five half all the way up to two n minus one by two. That gives you n square by two. And then all the different oscillators just give you this factor, combinatorial factor. So basically the fact that you can organize your Fox space of the fermions in this way tells you that uh, this fermionic partition function written this way it should be equal to this. But there's a, there's a mathematical identity, there's a physics proof of that mathematical identity. But uh, 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 again, if you want, if the details are not completely obvious, I will, uh, uh, I'll discuss that later. Uh, uh, so in particular, the bilinears, so the, uh, um, well, okay. Uh, um, uh, uh, let me just say that uh, these, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, so what we will use is, so this was just one of the fermionic building blocks, whereas a boson is built out of two fermions. So there is this and this, but they just, they are very similar, just Y replaced by Y inverse. So if you are looking, uh, so this, if I use this identity, uh, then it's very easy to see uh, that this, Combined with this implies the following identity. So basically, uh, it's very simple if you are looking at the white, uh, is the neutral part, because here this is a series with increasing powers of y, and uh, the corresponding one with y inverse will have y to the minus n. So the only terms which will have y to the zero are when you multiply the y to the n term with the y to the minus n term. And that's what I have done here. So you just get the square of this, so q to the n square by two becomes q to the n square, and the denominator is also square. So this is a, a simple consequence of these two identities. And uh, so this is another decomposition, uh, a math this is just a mathematical decomposition at this stage of the chiral sector of a, a single boson. But I claim now that just like this, uh, was the character uh, at of a W infinity algebra uh, uh, with this n boxes and and the trivial representation? This was the this was the uh, the character of, of this representation. This is the character 
of uh, representation of a W infinity algebra, but a fermionic W infinity algebra, because we are now lo uh, looking in terms of the fermions. Uh, so this is a decomposition of the fermionic W infinity algebra, uh, but uh, with sort of Uh, something like this. So what I mean by this something, well, it has Dinkin labels N00N. Zero, zero, uh, and so there's sort of N fundamentals and N anti-fundamentals. So, uh, 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 so it's a particular uh, uh, representation of a fermionic W infinity. Uh, uh, this is the character of, of such a representation. Uh, and uh, uh, we can understand where this comes from because, in fact, the n equal to 1 term in this uh, uh, decomposition, um, uh, maybe I should have, uh, I mean, it's just notation, but uh, just so that I, I don't, I, I should call the dummy label, but I'll just call it m because I'm using n for, say, the column, so uh, that may not... Uh, 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 so, I, uh, so for uh, now, if we consider the m equal to one term in the series, uh, that corresponds to uh, the one zero zero one. That's just something where you have one fermion. So remember, uh, so here also we would have had m uh, and so on. So, uh, um, uh, so this. Uh, uh, so remember that. Uh, uh, M was the number of fermions over here. So the M equal to one case is the one where you have one fermion of uh, psi, and from here you get one fermion uh, uh, of the uh, anti-fundamental kind, psi bar. So the M equal to one term corresponds to bilinear of the fermions. So something like this psi bar uh, del to the s minus 1 psi. So, uh, so in fact, uh, you can see the m equal to 1 term over here uh, uh, gives you, uh, has one quantity for every spin. Uh, and these are precisely these uh, fermionic bilinears, which, uh, as, uh, we, uh, which as I mentioned uh, over here, uh, correspond to the top row of this, uh, uh, of this uh, table. So, uh, so, the, uh, so the bilinears of the fermions, so this is a different way of organizing. So this fermionization uh, of the bosonic theory gives a, a different way of organizing the chiral algebra uh, uh, by what these mathematical identities really mean is that I can organize things now in terms of the number of fermions. Here, this index M labels the number of fermions, whereas in this way of organizing it, here, N label the number of bosons, uh, and N equal to two were the bilinears, et cetera. But here, in this way of organizing, the number of, uh, we are doing it in terms of the number of fermion oscillators, in the occupancy of the fermion oscillators, and M equal to one corresponds to one, uh, one fermion of this kind and one of its uh, opposite kind. And that uh, is, uh, so that the fermion boson dictionary tells you corresponds to del phi to the S, so it uh, cuts across all these columns and is in fact just the top row, the one with lowest dimension. Uh, so, um, so that's uh, the, uh, uh, that's the sort of uh, 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 picture that this decomposition you have. Uh, uh, so this is, these generate the fermionic W infinity, or rather it's what is called W1 plus infinity because actually there's a spin one uh, uh, when S is equal to one psi bar psi generates a spin one field as well. So there is, uh, so this is what is called W1 plus infinity which uh, in the 
in the general taxonomy of W infinity algebras is the one which corresponds to this parameter lambda equal to zero. So these generate, these bilinears generate this, and the other terms which are over here are representations of this fermionic W infinity, and uh, they, they transform into, in this representation labeled by the stinking labels of this lambda equal to zero. Uh, w infinity algebra. So what do we have over here? This tells us that we have a, a different decomposition uh, now uh, of our chiral algebra. So it's the same chiral algebra, but we have decomposed it uh, now in terms of, so there is this, which is the which we will call the W infinity, the horizontal W infinity uh, algebra. And then there are other rows, which, so this was M equal to one, M equal to two, and so on, general M. So this is another way of slicing the whole uh, chiral sector in terms of uh, the fermions. So, uh, so we see this interesting sort of uh, two alternative ways of slicing uh, the chiral algebra, uh, both of which uh, organize, both of which organize uh, the elements in terms of representations, either of the uh, vertical or the horizontal uh, uh, W infinity algebra. So this is the one we'll call the horizontal higher spin algebra or the vertical higher spin algebra, uh, the horizontal higher spin algebra, or horizontal W infinity algebra. And uh, each of these, the, when you go along these rows, the, those are W infinity, the horizontal W infinity descendants. When you move along each of these rows, as I said yesterday, moving along the columns is uh, by the uh, vertical W infinity algebra. So these two algebras together sort of uh, generate uh, what we call this higher spin square because now knowing both these algebras and their commutators effectively allows you to uh, compute commutators between arbitrary elements like uh, I said, uh, let's say between here and here. Uh, uh, how is that? Because um, so these two W infinity algebras effectively generate the full uh, unbroken stringy algebra, stringy symmetry of this background. And so we call this the higher spin square because these two are sort of orthogonal uh, uh, W infinity algebras uh, and, uh, uh, and they generate this whole square. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you should remember this notation when I say it's square, it doesn't mean that the algebra is some tensor product of these two. It's a, it's a slightly more unusual, uh, uh, unusual structure, which I don't know its proper mathematical terminology or its home. Uh, in fact, I've tried to ask a few mathematicians and I've not gotten anything uh, very useful. But if any of you know what kind of structure this is, and in fact, I'll make it a little bit more concrete in a baby example very soon, uh, um, uh, an example which all of you would have seen. Uh, um, so, uh, so if there's a nicer, name for it, please tell me, but uh, we will, uh, at the moment, uh, we go with our coined term of uh, uh, a higher spin square. And uh, 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 so, uh, so why is the fact that uh, you have these two W infinity algebras, uh, uh, how does that help you in getting the arbitrary commutators? Oh, sorry, yeah, Mosen. Sorry? So, 
So this is, of course, the number of fields here are much, it's a stringy spectrum. And the chiral algebra is also stringy in the sense that it has a Cardi-like growth. Uh, it's, uh, so, uh, so the number of, uh, uh, so yeah, so I wouldn't say that we are reformulating the Vasiliev theory. It is, we are trying to, I would say it's a way of organizing the string theory in terms of Vasiliev-like higher spin symmetries using and with the idea uh, of eventually using the Vasiliev structure to maybe write down the, because Vasiliev has solved the problem of how to construct interacting theories of an infinite tower of these. And uh, to some extent, he has coupled some matter fields to that. Here we have a problem where we have the Vasiliev fields, of course, uh, but we have infinitely many others transforming in some representation. Uh, but uh, the, in fact, these are all gauge fields, so it's much bigger than Vasiliev. Uh, and string theory combines them into giving you a consistent description of all these. Uh, so it's uh, somehow larger than Vasiliev. But the fact that there are these two, so there's not just the original Vasiliev symmetry, but there's another newer uh, emergent Vasiliev symmetry when you organize in terms of the horizontal W infinity. Combining both these two, I think, so you should be able to, I, I think the, the fact that there are these two different uh, Vasiliev-like symmetries uh, combining should be the key to understanding the symmetry of the full structure because as I said, Vasiliev tells you how to organize each of them, so presumably you should be able to take that to understanding uh, this too, but that's something, of course, uh, is for future work. Uh, but at the moment, I'm just uncovering a certain structure uh, uh, that is there in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this symmetry algebra. Uh, so, so as I said, so this higher spin square uh, uh, structure, uh, uh, earlier by, as I said, by organizing in terms of these representations, it was easy to take the commutator of some arbitrary element with some element of this column, and that was given by W infinity commutators because these were specific representations of this algebra. Uh, uh, but now we can, uh, uh, now that we have this other W infinity, the vertical w, uh, the horizontal W infinity, and each of these are also representations under this. Uh, uh, so this first row is the uh, is the horizontal W infinity. Since we know both these, if you want to take commutator between two arbitrary elements, you can do one of two equivalent things. You can uh, so this is some descendant of some element here, right, by, uh, by the horizontal, by the vertical W infinity. So, uh, so this, there's uh, corresponding to this element. Uh, uh, this element comes, is in some, lies in some particular column. There is the highest weight represent, uh, highest weight state of that representation in that column uh, that's related to this by action of some W infinity descendants. Uh, so these two, uh, uh, so knowing, if I know the commutator of this with this, then uh, I know the commutator of this with this because this is just given by some further descendants of the W infinity. So it's equivalent to knowing the commutator, uh, computing the commutator of this with this. But that we now know because this will lie in some row and you can use the fact that this is, uh, this generates the horizontal W infinity. So the commutator of this with this is given by a horizontal W infinity commutator. Or you could have done the other way around. You could have taken this to this column. This is related by some horizontal W infinity action uh, to some element over here. And then you compute the uh, commutator of this with this. In fact, the closure of these two, uh, the uh, operations also, I think, gives you some very strong uh, constraints on the commutator, the fact that both these operations should give you equivalent commutators, uh, uh, I, I think gives a strong constraint on the, uh, the nature of the full algebra. So, uh, so uh, what I mean to say is that this uh, higher spin square 
uh, is a very tight structure. Uh, it's a very tight structure which is governed completely by the horizontal uh, W infinity and the vertical W infinity. Knowing just commutators of representations of uh, these, um, um, uh, uh, these two W infinities is enough to specify all the commutators of the algebra. So, okay, so this structure at least was sort of unfamiliar to us. As, uh, uh, so we uh, thought a little bit and realized that there was something very similar to this, in some ways very analogous to this, uh, which, uh, uh, is, uh, which all of you uh, can appreciate. And this is uh, what we call the Clifford algebra square. So let me describe that, uh, since it's very neat. Uh, so, so, uh, so as the name suggests, we consider the Clifford algebra, or gamma matrix algebra, uh, in 2K Euclidean dimensions. So basically, there are uh, the, uh, and, uh, the gamma i's, which go from I equal to 1 to 2k, and they obey the usual, the Euclidean uh, uh, gamma matrix algebra. Uh, uh, so, so now, uh, uh, you must have all studied when you studied Dirac equation, uh, uh, and so on, that uh, you have the antisymmetric bilinears uh, of these gamma matrices generate the algebra SO2n. In fact, that's why uh, you, uh, this is the spinner uh, representation uh, of uh, SO2n. So these are the generators of SO2n, right? Uh, 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 so, uh, uh, so these are anti-symmetrized. Uh, uh, so, but of course, uh, these are not the only uh, combinations you can uh, uh, construct. Was there a question? Oh, sorry, SO2K, yeah. Uh, yeah, at some point I uh, switched. Uh, so if I make this mistake again, just to remind me, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so, uh, uh, so, th so these are the uh, anti-symmetric bilinears. Of course, the symmetric one is just delta ij, so that's trivial. Uh, um, that's the identity matrix. Uh, 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 so, uh, but we can uh, we can organize. Uh, we can, in fact, consider uh, the following combinations: just gamma i, then gamma i, gamma j. So we can consider all the antisymmetric combinations of these. And we know that each of these I'll draw as a column because each of these forms an irrep of so the general gamma i1 to gamma in. This transforms in the antisymmetric representation uh, of SO2N, or SO2K, right? Uh, these are, uh, they, they, each of the, uh, so as you let the gamma i's uh, uh, range over their values, uh, the, each of these forms a, a, a representation, and the SO2K is the vertical uh, algebra that acts on these, each, so there's a highest weight state of this representation, and then uh, there's a whole tower, and each of these has their appropriate dimensions. Uh, 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 so, uh, so you have, so you can uh, consider all these, and if you wish, you can even add the identity. Uh, 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 so each of these uh, uh, is a decomposition uh, of uh, 
uh, I mean, each of these is an irrep of uh, uh, SO2K uh, with this vertical action. So this is what we will call the vertical algebra. Uh, uh, but because these are, uh, uh, so again, we have the similar thing where the, the, the adjoint or the, uh, the, the n equal to 2 case is the SO2K itself, generates the SO2K itself. And all these are under some representation. So I can take commutator of this with this. Uh, and I know that it transforms in the appropriate representation. Uh, uh, but because these are gamma matrices, they are formed from an underlying Clifford algebra, I can take commutators across any two rows, uh, or any two columns. And in fact, if I just denote the vector space of a particular column by HM, uh, then schematically you can see that the commutator of the mth column with the nth column is, uh, is a sum uh, from some and with some structure constants. something like this. There you get back things with, uh, between, uh, uh, so these, uh, uh, the, there's a sort of a horizontal algebra between the, uh, uh, between the different columns. Uh, the mth column and the nth column give you some linear combination of uh, columns which go from some R min to some R max, which you can write in terms of M and N, but that's not important, and, and there are some numbers here, <laughs> uh, but uh, so this is the, in fact, this algebra is sort of very similar to a W infinity fermionic algebra which, in which the generators have very similar sort of uh, uh, the W infinity of spin S and spin S prime have, uh, uh, have uh, uh, a similar sort of commutation relations. But in any case, so this is what we would call a horizontal uh, uh, algebra or a horizontal action, uh, and uh, uh, so you can, uh, so you, uh, so this whole space of these gamma matrices, you can organize in terms of these, you can slice it in terms of these vertical ones, or equivalently uh, with, uh, so the sort of, uh, 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 in terms of SO2K acting vertically, or in terms of sort of a horizontal algebra like this. But the interesting point, which I think is very, makes it very close to this particular case, is that you can ask what is the full algebra here uh, uh, of all these gamma matrices. It's not SO2K, of course, but you know what the answer is because this is something, again, you would have learned when you studied the Dirac equation, that the gamma matrices can be realized by uh, matrices of uh, size 2 to the k, because it's in 2k dimensions, so 2 to the dimension by 2, so it's of size 2 to the k, and you can, by the sort of arguments that you learn and you do gamma matrix algebra, they're all traceless, you can make them Hermitian, and so on, so they, uh, in fact, generate all of uh, SU, two to the k. So the full uh, algebra here, the full stringy symmetry algebra, if you wish, the, uh, of the square is SU two to the k. Or if you include the uh, identity, you can, um, you, have a, uh, you have a plus identity, but uh, it's, and you see, this has the same feature that we saw in our stringy algebra, namely the vertical algebra this had rank which was like k, uh, whereas this has exponentially larger rank. Right, it's like two to the k. Uh, um, so, uh, so it's not some kind of tensor product or anything like that. It's exponentially larger in size, and this is what we saw in uh, the higher spin square as well, uh, that, uh, that the, uh, each of these 
uh, vertical or horizontal algebras had essentially one, uh, uh, one generator at each spin. Uh, but the full thing had a Hagadon, sorry, a Cardi kind of a, a growth of uh, uh, states, uh, uh, exponential in the number of, in the, in the uh, uh, spin. And uh, uh, so this is, uh, this enhancement here is, uh, is very similar. And so in many ways, this sort of, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable analog of, of this and at least gives some sort of intuition for this structure. But, uh, but this is not, uh, the case here, I must say, is not a Clifford algebra, so it's not, uh, it's not quite the same, either not some infinite dimensional version of this. So what exactly the relation of the two is, I, I don't know, but it seems to have a similar mathematical nature to this. And as I said, I don't really know what the terminology for this should be. So, uh, so that's, um, so now, uh, so this uh, highest, yeah. Yeah, so that big group, we don't know what to call it. I mean, so we've just called, I mean, it's, as of now, it's some um, uh, uh, higher spin square. You can, if you wish, call it W2 to the infinity or something. I don't know uh, if that's a name. It's not, because that would have had uh, generators which have just the product of the two, uh, whereas this is exponentially larger. So it's generated in a, in a more, I mean, you see, it's, again, that's why I'm not sure what is the exact structure, because these are representations of the original one, and, but the representations themselves form elements of an algebra. Uh, and so each of, there are things transforming in these, rep, yeah, so I, I, I would very much, I think it would very much help to understand this mathematical structure, or at least place it in some familiar context. Uh, to be able to uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to to get more uh, uh, leeway about into the properties of this. Uh, so uh, uh, okay, so uh, uh, that's sort of more or less where we are at the moment. So I'll just conclude by with some remarks uh, and. Uh, um, So this, uh, uh, this higher spin structure, so we, uh, so I remember I started off with the question of, is there some kind of uh, larger gauge symmetry? Uh, and, uh, 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 and so we have some, uh, we see that these ADS3 vacua do have some kind of, exponentially larger unbroken gauge symmetry than the Vasiliev ones, uh, than, the, than in a higher dimensional ADS where it's only the Vasiliev gauge symmetry. Um, uh, so, uh, so clearly this should be powerful if this is the unbroken gauge symmetry, it should, we should be able, so you, you can ask what can we do with this uh, higher spin square. Uh, uh, so there are many possibilities. So this is all just things that we are in the midst of doing and uh, uh, understanding. So no, I won't give you any uh, complete statements. But uh, uh, the first thing is move away from lambda equal to 0 uh, in a controlled way. Uh, uh, so remember, uh, uh, this was the motivation with which I started off these lectures, that we want to sort of move away from, say, lambda equal to zero, and uh, it, that was the, the motivation was this, there's a symmetry that will enable us to sort of uh, um, um, do that in a controlled way. So what can we say about that question in the light of uh, everything that I've said right now? Well, there you can make a few statements. Uh, uh, firstly, so in this symmetric product case where we, uh, we can ask uh, how uh, are you going to move away from uh, uh, lambda, 
Yeah, there's one, there are many marginal deformations in this CFT. Uh, in fact, there's a 20 parameter family of them. Uh, but mo many of them, 16 of them, are very boring. They are just the shape of the T4, uh, et cetera. There are four um, more interesting ones. Uh, but in fact, one uh, of them is the really the one which you would think of as uh, go, uh, really going away from, which would, I think, be justifiably called the lambda. And this is the so-called Z2 twisted sector marginal operator, which is a singlet under the R symmetry. Uh, so this is the thing that blows up uh, there's in the Z2 sector, uh, within, any, within the symmetric group, of course, there's always a Z2 uh, in the symmetric group of uh, any uh, N elements. Uh, uh, so there's a, you can consider Z2, which sort of permutes two elements. Uh, and uh, 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 there's a twisted sector mode in the twisted sector of that, uh, uh, in the Z2 twisted sector, there's a, mm, uh, there's a lowest dimension operator, uh, which is a marginal operator of the CFT, which corresponds to what you would call as the blow up mode of that Z2, uh, the desingularization of that Z2. And uh, this uh, is the thing that um, is most interest uh, in, uh, as the deformation uh, 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 parameter, uh, and uh, 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 while I didn't describe this in these lectures, I mentioned at the beginning that it was not just the chiral sector of the uh, symmetric orbifold, but the full spectrum of the full partition function, the full spectrum of the uh, uh, symmetric product that could be organized in terms of representations of the higher spin uh, algebra. So this Z2 twisted sector itself is transforms in a very definite way, in a definite representation uh, of the, uh, this vertical W infinity uh, 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 that we describe, this, this one. So, uh, uh, so th though that's, uh, that of course is a, it's not a chiral, it's not in the chiral sector, so it doesn't appear in this uh, square. It's a matter field, but which transforms also in a specific representation with some lambda plus and lambda minus, uh, uh, but now both of them are non-zero, unlike these examples. Uh, uh, so it uh, transforms in a definite representation of this. So that means, what does that mean? That means that when you turn on this marginal operator, you're giving a wave Uh, to a field which is charged. So from the uh, point of view of the bulk theory, uh, the operator that, the field that couples to this marginal operator uh, of the CFT uh, is a field which is also, uh, because this one is in a non-trivial representation of W infinity, the corresponding field uh, is also charged under the Vasiliev uh, vertical W infinity, uh, uh, higher spin, uh, and therefore also the higher spin square under this bigger algebra. Uh, and so you're giving a wave to a field uh, which is charged under uh, the symmetry that you're breaking. That is a classic thing that you do in a Higgs mechanism. You are giving, uh, uh, you have a gauge symmetry, a uh, large unbroken gauge symmetry. Now you turn on a wave for a particular operator or a field, uh, which is charged under in a specific representation of that. So this is what you call Higgsing. So you're Higgsing the, this Vasiliev symmetry. So you're Higgsing the W infinity or the higher spin square. So it's not some uncontrolled breaking of the symmetry. It is a very definite pattern of the symmetry breaking in terms of you know, a particular representation. And so you might think that you might be able to move away from it in a very controlled way in that the symmetry should still govern the matrix elements in the broken phase. Uh, 
So just like in the standard model when you Higgs the SU2 times U1, uh, you can still use the underlying ward identities of the gauge symmetries, the SU2 cross U1 gauge symmetry ward identities still hold, uh, even though in the broken phase. Uh, and uh, that strongly constrains the structure uh, of the theory. So, um, the, uh, uh, so, so you should be, so, so of course these are fond hopes, uh, uh, should be able to, uh, uh, to calculate or to control the matrix elements Uh, uh, of the perturbed theory, if you wish, it's like the Wigner Eckhart philosophy that when you when you break rotational symmetry, you turn on something in a particular representation. Uh, nevertheless, the rotation symmetry governs the uh, matrix elements because it relates matrix elements of different quantities all in the same representation of this bigger symmetry. So, uh, so you should be able to use the fact that you're doing this Higgsing and use the sort of Wigner cut philosophy to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to control uh, moving away from this. So that's one thing one can hope to do with this and that would be a realization of the original uh, idea of the question uh, that motivated this talk. Uh, and uh, another thing I would like to understand is, um, uh, is uh, understand the representations of the higher spin square itself, uh, the full higher spin square. We understand how to group the spectrum in terms of representations of the W infinity, but now that the chiral algebra is much larger, that the higher spin symmetry is the sort of governing symmetry, uh, we should be able to understand the representations of this, and the full spectrum should be organized in terms of representations of this, rather than just the Uh, just the higher spin uh, 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 representations. So many higher spin representations will combine to form one representation of the bigger symmetry algebra, uh, uh, because this is, after all, a small piece of this big square. Uh, um, so it's like over here, we had uh, under the SU2 to the K, There'll be many things which were, if you have things uh, now which are representations of SO2K, uh, and which secretly are uh, also representations of this, then of course many, many representations of SO2K will have to combine to form representations of SU2 to the K. So, so, uh, the, so this is in fact related to this. Uh, the, the power of moving away from this will be so we understand it's in a definite representation of W infinity, but that will mean that it's also in a definite representation of this bigger one. So that will give even more sort of group theoretic sort of constraints on the, uh, uh, on the different states. So we would be able to group different W infinity representations into one, uh, into one bigger representation, but for that you have to understand a bit more about the representation theory of this higher spin square. We understand representations of W infinity, but uh, as of now we don't have any clue about the representations of this bigger, bigger object. But, um, um, but one sort of preliminary result which we are uh, trying to uh, completely firm up uh, is that, but uh, so preliminary, uh, is that the entire untwisted sector so uh, of the symmetric product 
seems to be one representation. And it's multi-particles. Uh, of the higher spin square of this bigger thing. It seems to be one, in fact, in some ways, the simplest non-trivial representation we can find, the analog of a fundamental representation. Uh, uh, so the entire untwisted sector seems to be one quantity. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, and then it's multi-particles. No. Uh, 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 binding on T4, you mean? Uh, no, no, no. So the T4, we are taking no charges under the T4. Yeah, so when I say untwisted sector of the, just of the, idea, uh, I mean the uh, R4 theory, yeah. <coughs> so in a way, this is very similar to the Vasiliev description uh, in the Cosette's, uh, Cosette models, where all the non-trivial primaries of the Cosette could be at least the so-called perturbative sector of the primaries of the Cosette, which was an infinite set of Cosette representations, was one scalar field and its multi-particle states of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the Vasiliev theory. This is a bit analogous to that, except now, instead of the Vasiliev theory, we have the full higher spin square. So I think this is, if this is indeed right, uh, that's a sort of illustration of how powerful this can be, how nicely it can organize the things. Of course, the interesting thing is to ask about the twisted sector. Can we organize the twisted sector uh, in, into, say, a specific set of representations, uh, very definite representations? Then I think you can use it to, re to, to, uh, to make a statement even more powerful than we have over here uh, because it would be some definite representation not just of the W infinity but of the full higher spin square and uh, uh, but that we still haven't made much progress so I, I will leave over there thanks.